Good afternoon and welcome to this event at Glasgow COP and to this afternoon we're focusing on tidal energy and looking at its contribution to our future energy systems. My name is Gareth Davis and I'm Managing Director of Aquaterra and I'm delighted to have the opportunity to chair this session this afternoon and I'm joined by three colleagues who work in the tidal energy sector and are ready to share their insights into what we're trying to do here for the future of sustainable energy. So on my left I have Andrew Scott from uh, uh, Orbital Marine, uh, I've also got Keith Murray here from QED Naval and Max Karkas from Sustainable Energy. Um, so what I'd like to do first of all is let each of the three of those uh, gentlemen introduce themselves and then we'll get into some Q&A about tidal energy after that. So Andrew, perhaps you'd like to introduce your company. Yeah, sure, certainly. So uh, I'm Andrew Scott. I'm the CEO of a company called Orbital Marine Power. Um, we're based in Orkney, actually, uh, where Gareth's from, uh, which is uh, the tidal equivalent of Graceland, really. It's the <laughs> centre of the tidal universe. Some really strong tidal streams pour through the channel between Orkney and the mainland of Scotland. Uh, everybody knows Pentland Firth and the channels in the Orkney Islands. So it's uh, uh, an ideal place to uh, develop technology. Um, we have the European Marine Energy Centre up there that allows us to test grid-connected devices. So we've been pioneering quite a, a novel technology for the last almost 20 years um, in that it actually floats. Um, so it looks more like a boat than it does uh, maybe an underwater wind turbine, but it's a, a hull vessel um, with two kind of legs that come down with rotors at the end of that. It, it's kind of space AG, your best to go on our website or something like that and you'll see how it kind of works but it's anchored in the tidal sites and we were the world's first company to grid connect a floating tidal turbine back in 2010 that was a 250 kilowatt machine and since then we've kind of scaled the technology in response to market demand and cost imperatives so we built a two megawatt prototype back in 2015 and more recently we built what we uh, are calling our commercial demonstrator unit which is another two megawatt unit uh, the O2 turbine, we launched it from Dundee earlier this year um, and towed it up to, to Orkney where it's now grid connected and generating power into the, into the local Orkney grid. It's the world's most powerful tidal turbine at 2 megawatts and it's what well, we want to see the start of a commercial phase for our business. So we now are focused on growing commercial revenue streams to build tidal stream turbines and then deploy them in commercial projects. Initially, hopefully, the focus will be here in the UK, where we can entrench and grow a supply chain, but ultimately, we want to take the technology and the business uh, into a global setting. Thanks very much, Andrew. Um, Keith, perhaps you'd like to introduce QED Naval to us. Thank you. Um, I'm Keith Murray, and I'm the Chief Commercial Officer for QED Naval, which was established in uh, 2008, uh, really, on the, uh, really on the founding director, Jeremy Smith's uh, power and passion for all things renewable and tidal. Uh, he did a lot of sea sailing and uh, as a naval architect uh, couldn't quite believe the costs of deploying uh, and the shipping involved in getting marine and tidal energy systems into, into the oceans and he quite simply set out to design and develop a, a self-deploying foundation system which some two and a half years later of testing off in the seas off Ireland has gone on to really evidence some amazing cost savings, you're saving 6%, like 6 to 7% on operations and shipping costs, but also about 48% on yields, which is by giving greater directional stability onto its turbines. The business went on uh, later, uh, in, or later on in 2019, 2020, early 2020, to actually acquire a, the Dutch company Takado, and that brought to the equation in a joint venture partnership perhaps one of the world's most proven and, and tried and tested turbines, um, which have seen and are used by the Dutch government in the likes of their Ooster Shelter or, or, or OTP Dam. And that's a, and a fairly iconic project and, and, and example um, for, for, for the rest of the world and just the power of, of, of such energy systems, marine energy systems. In fact, it was showcased by Macquarie Capital recently at uh, their Global Climate Adaptation Summit is you know, replicable in, in, in some 451 flood prevention schemes globally. So you know we see a huge potential for you know self-deploying uh, foundation systems and tidal, tidal turbines as part of of, a, of an energy mix going forwards. That's great, Keith. Thank you very much. 
And finally, Max, would you like to introduce uh, Sustainable Energy, please? Yeah, no, sure. Yeah, so I'm Max Karkas uh, with uh, Sustainable Marine, and um, uh, I'm strategic advisor with uh, Sustainable Marine. We, um, we're a relatively small company. We have 37 people, um, but we're also quite an international company. We've got uh, offices in Leith, uh, in Edinburgh, uh, that's where our HQ is, uh, and offices in Canada, where we're deploying uh, our first uh, commercial project, and also in Germany. Uh, we have a major shareholder in the form of Schottel, a uh, German company that supplies our turbines. Um, so about half of our staff, I think, are, are here in the UK. Um, our technology is uh, a floating platform, like Orbital's. Um, it's uh, a bit smaller, it's uh, 420 kilowatts, and the idea is you deploy a number of platforms to form uh, a project. Uh, each of our platforms has, uh, at the moment, has six turbines on it um, that uh, give us uh, a lot of reclabit... Uh, how do you say that? <laughs> anyway, you know, the, get the idea. Um, <laughs> so, um, uh, the project we're building in Canada is, um, is actually the world's first uh, privately financed, uh, project financed, um, uh, tidal energy project. Now we're at the stage where we're just building that out. Uh, we've been operating there since uh, 2018 uh, in a location called Grand Passage and we're building out a, a project at the uh, Canadian uh, Tidal Energy Test Centre in the Bay of Fundy and uh, that project is called the Benback Project uh, which is a, a nine megawatt project. So we're in the stages of, of building that project out. Um, we also have a UK subsidiary called Swift Anchors, and as part of this journey, we've um, developed novel technology for securing tidal turbines to the seabed um, using drilled anchors that can also be used in other areas, such as floating offshore wind, uh, aquaculture, and also for other people in the tidal industry and wave industry. So um, we've already deployed about 37 of these anchors and are looking to exploit that technology uh, in other fields. Um, so that's probably about it from me. Um, but Gareth, I think you should probably introduce yourself and your company as well. Oh, thank you very much, Max. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, I'm Managing Director of Aquaterra. Uh, we're based up in the Orkney Islands, as Andrew mentioned, uh, headquartered there. Um, and we, unlike these other three organisations, we run a consultancy business uh, and project development business. So we've helped all of the companies that are here and they've helped us because they're developing technologies which allow us to bring projects forward in the future. Um, and one of the things that interests us is the international uh, dimension and taking technologies that have been developed in the UK and deploying them around the rest of the world. Um, and hopefully through this program, um, you'll begin to see the breadth and the depth of, of the tidal sector and where we're at, some of the opportunities and the challenges that are associated with it. So I think hopefully you've already seen and got a sense of the granular businesses that we've got here in the tidal energy sector. We've got three technologies, each of them with a distinctive approach to extracting energy from moving currents. And one of the things I just wanted to emphasize for uh, our viewers was the, the characteristics of what we're talking about here of predominantly in-stream technologies, although through your link now with Takado and, mm -hmm. and the, the deployment they have in Holland, that's actually a, a semi-empowerment version mm -hmm. of the technology. But the difference there is that in-stream technologies are designed to take energy from the naturally flowing streams of water that exist around headlands and in narrow channels as tides flow around our coastlines. Um, and that's very distinctive and different from the tidal barrage type systems which enclose a piece of water and then allow the water to flow out in, in, in at certain times of the, uh, the tidal cycle. Um, and I just wonder if we could help our viewers understand what are the distinctive advantages that come with in-stream technologies rather than technologies that are related to empowerment. And mm -hmm. um, it doesn't mean that one's better than the other necessarily, yeah. but they are distinctively different. And Andrew, maybe you know, it, what for you is the, the characteristic of in-stream uh, technologies that, that would differentiate it from other forms of, uh, of energy generation? So, well, it differentiate between tidal stream and tidal barrage. Yes, yes. Yeah, so I mean, uh, fundamentally it's a different form of the energy, uh, although it's being driven by the same underlying force, which is gravitational effects um, from principally the moon and then the orbits of the Earth and the moon around the sun are the main drivers and clearly that's a dis differentiator for renewables in general so we're not 
tied to uh, uh, to wind climatical conditions. So, in that way. There's a very interesting proposition that the tidal space has, which is this predictability. Yeah. Um, it is intermittent because we go between flood tides and ebb tides, so there's a slack water between those. And indeed, there's a change between spring tides and neap tides. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, there is intermittency there, but it is perfectly predictable. So at a very short period of time with uh, measurement equipment, we can characterize a tidal stream site uh, in the course of you know four weeks of measurement, and we can then predict with a high degree of accuracy for the next 10, 15, 20 <coughs> years, um, not just when we're going to get energy, but how much we're going to get energy. Yeah. And actually, there's as much value in knowing when you're not going to be generating power as when you are going to generate right. power in terms of maintenance and things like that. So um, some very interesting things, and we'll maybe explore them in terms of differentiators that that, you know, business models, you can actually warrant power, not availability from an equipment supply. There's interesting things there. But in terms of the differentiator, impoundment is really looking at potential energy, the differentiator between, you know, high and a low and trapping high, you know, when you get to high tide, trapping that, and then I think it'll let it flow out. So that's a gravitational thing. Whereas what we're talking about here, tidal stream, is obviously that water that's causing it to go up and down has to come from movement, and where that movement is is constrained around headlands or through channels, it becomes accelerated. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, uh, in in the kind of sites that we're looking at here, they are quite uh, unique sites, environments, because you get water accelerating up to flow speeds of three or four meters a second, which for wind people doesn't sound very fast, but when you consider that water is 800 times the density of air, the amount and volume of, of energy is super concentrated yeah, yeah, in these yeah, tidal yeah. stream sites. Really, really dense. So to give you a practical example, you know, we've got one megawatt uh, generators at the end of each of these legs. Um, we've got basically a 20 meter rotor diameter that will generate two megawatts of power, or a megawatt from power at 2.5 meters a second. Yeah. You know, that's almost an order of magnitude less the length of blade that you would be needing for a light like sized wind turbines. So everything's super dense, super concentrated, and we're tapping into something that is entirely predictable um, yeah. in terms of yeah. when we get the energy and so forth. Um, so the, the, that's the main kind of differentiator uh, and attractions. Um, it comes with its own unique set of challenges from an engineering perspective, but at the same time it has its upsides. Yeah, Gareth, can I? pick up on a couple of things because it's a really good question and one that, that's quite important for us in, in Canada. Um, first of all, there's an environmental question and um, the difference between a, a tidal barrage is that, uh, and a, an in-stream tidal turbine is that uh, we might occupy you know, a relatively smaller part of a particular stream or passage, a uh, tidal flow, whereas a tidal barrage you, you literally block the whole river yep. and all the water pours through the barrage. So um, it's a bit like a bathtub. Mm. And in terms of, you know, there have been studies that have shown that, um, uh, that this can have some environmental consequences in terms of silting and in terms of um, uh, potential uh, damage to fish. And that's something that we think that we, we don't have such uh, an issue with at all with in-stream uh, tidal turbines. In fact, we, we kind of call it um, ultra low impact hydro um, because that's really what we we think we have now there's still a lot of uh, work to be done to to establish that um, uh, for once and for all but certainly all of the work that's gone to date has shown that um, that the impacts from in stream tidal turbines uh, tend to be very small so that's one important aspect the other important aspect I think also from a sort of government point of view and looking at technologies is that Tidal barrages are really kind of civil engineering projects. Um, and so there are very different, um, <laughs> excuse the expression, very different kettle of fish um, <laughs> to, uh, to in-stream tidal uh, turbines where, you know, it's much easier to replicate, I've got the word now, and, uh, and, and, and build up, uh, you know, many iterations of, uh, of machines, whereas with tidal barrages, you look at something like the Seven Barrage or Laurent's, they tend to be kind of one-offs, and no doubt there is some learning in going from one project to another, but it, it's a very different kind of thing. So 
you know, in, in our particular case, I think it with, with, with our tidal technologies, the potential for cost reduction is so much greater because of that. So yeah. that, I think that's yeah. an important yeah. Yeah. So so It's an interesting perspective because you know, I think if you're looking at you know, barrage and tidal, undoubtedly that it's horses for courses in different scenarios. But when you're looking at a lot of the, you know, the, 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 the tidal stream works, you know, you're, you're looking at islands and communities and a lot is site specific and it is about engineering the right, right solution yeah. for the right location. And you, you talk about the metrics of sites and measuring and managing sites. You know, a large part, proportion goes around managing and measuring the resource in each area. But there's learning across the, across yeah, both, yeah, and yeah. without a shadow of a doubt, it's learning so, so and driving I think cost. Max is, uh, there is a real point here in terms of because a big driver for us <coughs> is levelised cost of energy exactly. down that cost curve. So, tidal stream, in stream mm -hmm. turbines is much more analogous to wind, where you, mm -hmm. you're deploying multiple units. So it's that unit replication economies of scale which yeah. we've seen demonstrated um, from the wind sector from the solar sector that is where you get your cost reductions which is distinctly different from as max said the civil projects that are basically yeah. tidal so, so one of the things that we've started to talk about here is the predictability of tidal energy um, and you know and, and so going on really for, from one of the other things that people talk about is you know you, you hear lay people saying well the tide's always there and, and of course, it's not quite always there because despite the predictability of mm -hmm. it, you've got high tide, low tide, and the tides flowing in between those two. And then we've got the sequence of spring and leaps, which I think Andrew referred to earlier on, which gives us variability. Um, so, but one of the things that when we talk about variability, I think it, it's thrown at renewables and, and marine renewables say, oh, it's variable, therefore it's not usable. But one of the things I think we've always observed is that actually all of our energy supplies a variable, mm. you know, oil mm. doesn't come out of the ground or gas doesn't mm. come out of the ground or uranium. Fuel doesn't. out of the, um, mm. the petrol pump. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, so all of our energy systems at the moment have storage built into them. Yeah. And I think, you know, one of the things we need to be able to articulate is how renewables can embrace storage along with the generation to provide yeah. a package. And, um, you know, particularly in Orkney, uh, there's things going on now with regards to hydrogen and batteries yeah. that are backing up that generation. And, you know, Andrew, I think, you know, you, you see this as part of the future. Yeah, it's not just about generating electrons, it's managing them in a way that delivers yeah. them to the customer in a usable way. Yeah, well, I think, you know, we very much, it's no longer, you know, an electricity space that we work in and decarbonise, it's an energy landscape. And clearly, uh, the drivers around trying to decarbonize some of those harder to hit areas of you know um, heating and transportation especially heavy transportation mm. and things like that they're clearly going to drive different markets um, for you know conversion and so forth so so yeah I mean uh, the O2 as it sits at the moment there's an electrolyzer up in Orkney where you know Orkney's doing a lot of really pioneering stuff that you know yourself you're centrally involved in it trying to decarbonize some of those harder areas. So that's great to kind of be doing that kind of pioneering lighthouse stuff there. Um, and there's battery storage. So yes, um, this ability to kind of shift. I mean, clearly, I think there's going to be, there's going to be innovation on the demand side, you know, where we start mm. to understand, you know, where, you know, whether it's going to be really windy periods or spring tides and we can concentrate industrial use of power into those sort of times. Um, so there's a demand side that we can use to help ourselves, but indeed, yeah, technology is on the battery storage. That's coming on leaps and bounds. So definitely, when you have a very predictable input source, mm -hmm. it makes the economics of battery storage start to become yeah. far yeah. more attractive in terms of being able to. People kind of talk about base load. I never really necessarily like base load, but you want to be able to sell power mm -hmm. when people need the power. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> and so battery storage, I think, definitely. And coupling it, there's nice synergies with tidal. Yeah, I think it's fascinating, actually, that nuclear is always put forward as the, the base load mm -hmm. panacea. But of course, a nuclear power plant likes to just give you level energy constantly. And our energy demand, there's mm -hmm. nowhere in the world where we just need constant renew, uh, power. So actually, nuclear power is as much out of phase with need as any of the variable uh, renewable sources. Mm. So I think we, we've touched there on the, the fact that variable energy outputs from the generation side are not necessarily a problem, you just need to manage them. Max, I wonder whether we could also just talk a little bit about things like co-generation and thinking about the mix of wind and wave and tide and mm. solar. Um, and particularly, I think, in the, in the wider world now, um, 
that there's a big increase going in um, floating solar, mm. uh, and that may be an interesting technology tie-up. And I think you know, your company's had a look at some of these synergies, and I know it's something that you're particularly interested in. So how do you see the opportunities for mixing tidal energy with other forms of energy generation? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, you know, our company, Sustainable Marine, is about supplying power to uh, coastal communities, uh, you know, on a sustainable basis. And so um, it just so happens that, you know, platforms can be quite a good way to do it um, from, the, from the coast. And so if there's a tidal stream, that makes a lot of sense. But, you know, maybe we can utilize some wind or some floating solar as well in order to provide that, that solution and, and provide uh, um, the, the power that people need and you know it may be in developing parts of the world for things like uh, mobile phone mo masts or to produce ice for example for fishing um, uh, that helps improve people's livelihoods and their ability to um, you know study in the evenings if they've got power for light and that kind of thing so um, so yeah I, I think with all of these things you have to look at the particular site and, and see what's what's the sort of right mix but um, if you kind of take a, a much bigger view, uh, somewhere like the UK, for example, um, there have been studies done uh, before in the past that have looked at, um, it, rather than just relying on wind and, and solar alone, but if you include marine in there, include wave, include tidal, um, you know, how much would that reduce the, the sort of backup uh, required for that? And um, this was from a few years ago, but the estimate at that time uh, in 2008 by a study carried out by Redpoint, which is now Beringa, um, identified a potential cost saving to the consumer by having that mixture of technologies of about two billion pounds per year. Now over 20 years, that's, uh, that's 40 billion pounds. Mm. That's half the subsidy that's, that's going to Hinkley that, as a saving by having a mixture yeah. of these technologies. So it, it kind of, you know, is a good argument for, for, for getting on with this stuff to, mm. in order to see, to see, you know, how well a, a, a role these things can, mm. can play. So, um, yeah, I don't know if that... Yeah, I, I think that's a really good point. So what we're starting to see here is not only that the variability of renewable energy is actually the same as other forms of energy, but by mixing the different forms of energy that we have at our resources, we can start mm. to reduce costs to the consumer, mm. not necessarily increase mm. them. Um, and, Keith, I wonder if you could maybe take us into the world of um, integrating with infrastructure, perhaps, and, and some of the opportunities there, because we've got bridges, we've got... Um, as we've talked about, we have uh, coastal defences and things like that, flood prevention systems, which you are directly involved in. Um, you know, do you see opportunities for infrastructure uh, to co-house generation um, in the future as part of the mix as well? I mean, absolutely, and I think it is again, it's site specific. So it's getting that mix correct for the the market that's local and and needed. Um, if you take, we're looking at a project on on, on Isla, for example. And there you've got the ability to quite simply take, help take the community off diesel and off grid. But then we're looking at distilleries and the likes of working with distilleries. Actually, we've been looking at uh, both a heat and a hydrogen solution where you can quite simply work with the offtake requirements for those specific, in that instance, distilleries and their working requirements. So it is site specific. And I think there's a great opportunity to work in with infrastructure projects, especially when you've got you know, dams or whatever that with, 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 with flows of tides going both ways. And it is just about using the local natural resource to its best. You know, we look at, we've been looking at submersible solution, you know, so it's, um, again, we were looking at a project in Indonesia uh, and for a mine, in fact, to, to, to actually put in batteries. Uh, we're a ballasted system, so we can swap out ballast for batteries. And there we get that much more predictable uh, balance load for, 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 in that instance, a mine. Yeah, no, it's excellent. So, so what we're beginning to talk about is the mixture of markets that is there to be served by tidal energy as well. And um, moving from infrastructure that might assist generation, Andrew, I'm also thinking about the infrastructure that allows us access to the markets. and. You know, you and I and, and Max actually particularly have been involved in basically a 20 year campaign to get grid connections to the parts of the UK where we have rich resources to allow that energy to be brought into the mix. Um, at the moment, the UK seems hell bent on putting connectors through to Europe and importing, you know, coal fired mm. energy from Germany instead of mm. renewable energy from the UK. I just wonder, you know, if we could just share our understanding of, you know, what that connectivity could give. UK PLC in terms of not just energy but the jobs and the economic benefit that comes with that as well. 
Yeah, I mean, I think we, you know, we've inherited a, or we've grown up with a, a legacy transmission system that was built around a different generation fleet, you know, and that's going to change uh -huh. massively. It already has, a generation fleet is, but a real constraint on that is the transmission connectivity yeah. and, the di and the locational uh -huh. signaling that comes with that, that we're all very, very uh -huh. aware of, certainly in the north of Scotland and the peripheries, where... We've known for a very long time these are the areas that are richest in renewable yeah. resources where you know, your, your assets, your generators, will be generating multiples of the amount of power. <laughs> if they're deployed there, then they would do um, closer to the load centers. And you know, I think that's the kind of pushing water uphill, it feels like, <laughs> in the sector for quite a long time, that you know, we, we can't approach that kind of strategic infrastructure on a no regrets basis because it's clear the amount of energy that sits in the waters and the land around from you know, the Orkneys and Shetland and the Western Isles um, can be treated on that type of basis, is that if you upgrade, you provide two, three gigawatt connection to them, it will be filled yeah, um, yeah. with clean energy. Yeah. So I think um, you know, we've been involved in this sector long enough that we've been through a number of transmission charging reviews and we've never seen a shift change, but I think yeah with what's planned around Scotwind and all these types of things is that there's yet more uh, industry evidence of a needs case that transmission I think needs to be treated on a strategic basis and almost on a no regrets basis and that it can unlock unlock masses amounts of inward investment into these regions and yeah. coastal communities. Yeah, yeah I think that's, that's a point that Max you got yeah, to no, develop well, a bit well, further. I was just going to say, I mean, you know, we've got this massive resource singing off our coasts. We've got a climate emergency. Um, you know, if, if this was an oil resource, um, then, you know, it, would, it, it just seems like it would be treated very differently. You know, we build roads and infrastructure to access that. We have done in the past. We built um, power lines for the nuclear industry, for Dune Ray. Yeah. Um, we've got this huge resource. And what doesn't make any sense at all uh, and it's sometimes argued that it makes sense, is to build incrementally small bits of infrastructure because there's uh, a perceived risk that you might end up with um, stranded assets. But what it ends up doing is costing the consumer a lot more because if you build a, a gigawatt link and that immediately fills up, then you have to build another gigawatt link. Now, building two gigawatts at the same time might cost you 10 or 20% extra, but building two separate gigawatt links will cost you twice as much. So, you know, you really need to take a strategic view on this. And you know, we know where we have to get to by 2050. We know we probably need everything in the box. We certainly need you know, wind, offshore wind, floating offshore wind. A lot of that is <coughs> marine resource. We can see the opportunity in tidal in, in other forms of marine energy. So you know, let's get on with it. Yeah. No, that's excellent. So I think what we're going to do is draw this first part of the program to a close. And we're going to take a short break. <laughs> Uh, what we wanted to explore in the <coughs> first session. Uh, the Sorry. <laughs> it's not a newer persistent cough, is it? No. You did do the test, yeah. didn't you? <laughs> but, um, yeah, what we've shown is that, you know, tidal energy, like all forms of energy, is variable in, in its output, but we've got ways of managing it. I think we've looked at the diversity of markets that tidal energy can serve and the relationships that can exist between tidal energy and other forms of renewables and infrastructure um, and also the enabling infrastructure to get access to the market. What we want to do in the next uh, session is maybe look at costs and the costs of energy production and how we're really making huge progress on that to deliver cost-effective energy, but also the variety of costs there are in the market. Um, and then maybe uh, we're going to hopefully have a third session where we start to look at the role yeah. of, of energy within our wider energy systems as well. So we hope to see you again in a few minutes. And thanks for watching and come back very soon.
So welcome back to this uh, session looking at tidal energy and its role within our future energy systems. Um, in the first segment of this program, we had a look at uh, the comparison of tidal energy with other forms of energy, um, maybe some of the markets that we could be thinking about and how tidal energy can make uh, a mix with other forms of generation and infrastructure uh, to contribute to our energy systems. What we wanted to do now is have a look in a bit more detail at the cost curve that tidal energy is on and some of the value of markets where tidal energy might be able to make a contribution. Um, so this is you know, how much our energy costs is very important to us at the moment. We've obviously been through uh, in the UK a recent period, well in fact it's not just the UK, it's actually global, where energy prices have increased significantly because of the price of gas and that shows our vulnerability to price hikes dependent on uh, hydrocarbons. Um, with renewables you don't have that problem because the fuel comes for free but what we have to do is invest in the technology and this is the stage that we're at with the technology at the present time. So maybe let's reflect on the, the amount that that costs and the, the value that it creates from that money because it's investment, it's not just cost. And maybe I'll just start again with you, Andrew. Um, you know, your company's been on a very distinctive journey, I think, in terms of scaling up and how you've raised your money and, and where you've got to. And maybe you could help the viewers understand you know, where you are on that journey as a start. And we can come back into the details of cost maybe when we understand some of the others as well. But you know, what's that journey of, of exploration of, of machine cost uh, been like for you? Yeah, so um, I think you know, there's an engineering journey that is a scaled one. You, know, you have to start small and make sure your engineering is right, the loads are right and all these sorts of things and try and generate the evidence case that your conceptual benefits, those drivers are all there sort of thing. So that's something, yeah, it's been a long process for us, 15 years or so. Um, but also, you know, clearly this isn't an academic exercise just to generate power at any cost. It's got to be something that we can see is close enough to policy to be able to, to, to provide an attractive option. So, you know, that's something that we've been very, very focused on. And it's not, you know, it's, it's as much a kind of uh, a balance of risk as being able to reduce that risk profile um, yeah. of uncertainty in early projects, early technologies, um, and getting the, co the cost right. So um, that's, been a, that's been a long process for us. And yes, uh, we understand the drivers around levelized cost of energy very well, characterize them very well um, within the company. Um, and scale is one of them. We know, we, we know that from just looking across into to wind. The technical <coughs> challenge is very similar to wind in yeah. terms of turning kinetic en energy into electrical energy. So that's one of the rationales of why we've taken our technology to the scale that we have, is that um, we do understand that has a, a direct feed through into levelized cost of energy. You, you touched on a word there, uncertainty, um, and I think that um, I'm not an engineer, I'm a marine biologist, um, and when I look into any of your companies, um, I see a bunch of really innovative and amazing engineers that have overcome incredible um, challenges to reach where we have done in the technology mm. space. Um, and I'm minded that the fact that we've kind of traveled to the bottom of the ocean, you know, we've been to moon with men, uh, we've been to Mars with machines, and yet, you know, it was a long time before we started to really embrace tidal energy. Um, and I think that, you know, for me, one of the things is as well as producing the machines, you've also produced a whole wealth of understanding about the environment and about engineering in that environment. And Max, I wonder whether, you know, we could think about the ways in which value is being created out of this sector. It's not just the machine, it's the wider benefit to our understanding and capacity mm. that, that we need to value. Absolutely. No, I mean, um, I mentioned earlier that we, we have a spin-off um, that has developed uh, rock anchors and uh, specific um, subsea drilling technology, which allows us to deploy this off quite a small vessel um, and, uh, and lower a rig that can drill these anchors into the seabed. Quite small anchors, um, but very high load carrying uh, capacity. And uh, as I said, they've got application in, in many other areas, such as um, floating offshore wind. But but also, um, we've, we're also he quite heavily investing in environmental technologies, environmental sensing technologies, um, so that we can you know, answer this question for once and for all um, about the, the impact 
uh, that we have, which we think is absolutely minimal. All the studies to date have sort of shown, but it can be quite often quite hard to demonstrate that in the in the sort of um, you know high energy environments in which we operate in. So we're doing quite a lot of work around that to to uh, ensure that we um, can satisfy regulators uh, in different countries, particularly in Canada. Um, so that's a, another interesting thing. And I think you know the whole thing around cost is is about doing stuff. Um, it's only once you've done something and put a point on the curve that you can see how you can then iterate that to to reduce cost. You can look at these things very theoretically, um, and you know part of the reason we're building our project in Canada is because there's a, a high feed-in tariff for for mm -hmm. tidal energy that exists there. Um, uh, Five hundred and thirty dollars a megawatt hour, which is fifty three cents a kilowatt hour, which is about thirty one pence uh, per kilowatt hour, which is it sounds very high uh, compared to you know consumer price of electricity, which is about sixteen seventy well it was it 's probably a lot more yeah, now with the higher gas price yeah. but um, the point is is that actually for an opening opening cost of a technology it 's actually very low if you look at just the cost of solar energy um, just in 2010. It was uh, 42 pence a kilowatt hour then, and it's, the cost has plummeted through that volume market deployment. The same with wind. Wind in the, in the 80s was more like sort of 80 pence a kilowatt hour, uh, and that's come right down to sort of, you know, the sort of 5 to 10 pence a, a kilowatt hour. And, you know, if you look at just conventional generation, coal-fired generation, the first coal plants were probably more like one pound fifty uh, a kilowatt um, hour. Mm. So... And, you know, there is a market for diesel energy, uh, diesel power um, market, but that price of that energy can also be quite expensive in today's market, you know, sort of uh, 30 to sort of 30 pence and above, 50 pence uh, a kilowatt hour is what can occur. Because the most expensive energy is the energy you can't get. Yeah. Um, and so there are different niches to sort of target. Um, I mean, obviously, it would be very straightforward if we could just um, be under the price of whatever the competing technology is. But the challenge is, is that we're a, a new technology competing against a lot of commodity technologies. Wind and solar are both commodity technologies. You know, the costs have come down. And so we're trying to break into that market. And, you know, if you tried to build a small, you know, one megawatt uh, nuclear power station or a small one megawatt um, offshore wind project, the costs would be astronomical. So what we, what we have to get to is the scale and I think what's quite often not well understood is that when I talk about a figure of 30 pence a kilowatt hour, people say, or 25 pence or whatever the figure is, uh, people think, well, you know, to get the cost down to be competitive with, with wind, for example, of, you know, 5 to 10 pence a kilowatt hour, that needs such a huge cost reduction in terms of the capital cost. You know, how can you possibly do it? Um, but what often isn't understood is that it's not just a function of the cost of the kit. It's a cost of capital. It's the cost of the kit. It's the cost of the balance of plant that gets associated with that. It's the operating cost. It's how that's shared between multiple machines from a, uh, an operating base, an operating team. Um, it's about the energy yield. It's about the reliability, the availability. And all of these things, actually, if you have incremental improvements on each of those areas, which is what exactly has happened in, in wind, you can see costs come down mm -hmm. you know, very rapidly through a sort of double, triple, quadruple whammy effect because it's not just one thing in isolation. And Sorry to talk at length no, no, on that, no, no. but I think it's an important yeah. point. And, and I think just, and I'm going to come back to, yeah. to you and your, your company in a minute, but just to develop this idea a bit further, because I think it's really important, is that you know, if you look at where the value in the energy stack is, you know, we're, we're quoting a price, if you like a base price of, say, under five pence per kilowatt hour mm. for grid-connected electricity. But, of course, we as customers are not paying that. Mm. You know, so that's, that's a value that's created for you as generators. But then all of the delivery mechanisms then price that up at, well, it was 15 pence, and it's now probably gone up towards 22, to maybe 25 in the spring. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, that value's gone somewhere. But if you could have access to local customers, say, mm -hmm. close to tidal streams at a price of 25 pence, mm -hmm. that might make a big difference to, well, to the you margins know, that you're if seeing. I, if, I, if I charge my 
my, I have an electric van, um, <laughs> if I charge that um, and, uh, uh, you know, on the motorway, you know, I can pay anything from, um, from, from nothing to, to I think it, uh, the highest was 75 pence a kilowatt hour. So, you know, it, the price depends where you are and what yeah. you need. So I think we need to think about that variability in, in, in pricing. And we'll come back to that and talk a bit more about that in mm. detail. But before we do, I just want to give Keith a chance to talk about the value that we have within these companies. You know, we've got technologies that we've invented and developed, but I think your company as well has this strong foundation of, of ancillary services and competencies that you've developed and enhanced through the journey of developing tidal technology. Um, you know, so you're innovation companies as much as tidal uh, energy companies, if you like. You know. Well, I think, same again, I mean, we're all innovators, and especially as you're leading in, in, in a, a sector, in effect. Um, and it does really come back down to this cost curve and, and, and there's a myriad of values, equations that we've got to match it, whether it's diesel and one and hydrogen or whatever we're competing against as a market. For us, um, it really came through, and picking up Andrew's point, really is about, it was optimization through design. Uh, you know, getting rid of the, the expense of long-term costs, because by and large these are long-term re recurring revenues and costs. So actually getting rid of some of the, 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 the the big, the big cost, the big principles like your, you know, your shipping and deployment and maintenance was a big focus. So by being self-deploying at, at a modular unit, that's a huge impact on your LCOE over time. But then it was design again, really just getting background of naval architecture uh, and, and, and designing submarines and propulsion systems. It was getting more flow onto the turbines. So you know, we have been able to get a lot more energy out of our turbines and therefore revenue. Yeah. And that is a big step at the start of your cost curve. But then we've got to follow the similar cost curves that everybody's got to do, whether that's through supply chain man and manufacturing expertise and skills and resource, and much of that's already available. Uh, and then economies. Yeah. And simply like in the other industries, it's economies of scale that will help really drive uh, the bigger changes. So it's part of a journey. We're on that LCOE. We're not the first industry or sector to be on a on an LCOE drive, and, and 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 much of the learnings there go to oil and gas, and and we've got a, 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 a huge amount of learning, and we've got the, the 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 cultural learning curve that wind has has been on and seen, and and and, and recognition, and drive and passion for change yeah. that they've got. So so I think what we're seeing here is that there is a clear progression in in cost reduction as you get more experience. You you roll out more technologies. And as a sector, when we go and seek support for you know, the monetary investment that's being required, um, one of the arguments we have to make is about value versus volume. Um, because you know, if you don't roll out a huge volume, you can afford a higher price. If you increase that volume significantly, maybe it's harder to justify a higher price. Um, and so you know, comparatively, I think the, the scale that we're talking about to take tidal energy from where it is today which is you know, the first ones and twos and threes, maybe up to fives and tens of the first turbines, to the point where we maybe have 10, 20, 30 of those turbines. That's really the next step that we're on, isn't it? And it's, it's, we're not trying to get to 1,000 straight away. We need to go for that first 10 or 20. Mm. And I just wonder whether that's um, something that is understood, that you know, each step that we take is, a, is gonna be a step down that curve. And, and therefore, as we go down and the volume gets bigger, then you know, we would expect the price to get more competitive as we go. I mean, that's absolutely right. I mean, you know, people look at a figure of, you know, whatever, 25 pence a kilowatt hour and say, oh, that's a bit high. But if the capacity is very small, you know, it's the first 10, 20 megawatts. I mean, it's, it's absolutely insignificant in terms of cost to the consumer. Um, and, you know, I mean, I think to date, the amount that's actually been spent on marine revenue, you know, from, from tidal energy and wave energy combined, um, is probably less than was spent on just designing the garden bridge in London. Um, mm. So, you know, it, 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 we've got a big resource here. Uh, we need to kind of get these first projects out there. And the, the key to that is, is by providing the support for revenue um, so that you can bring along investment, which is a crucial sort of aspect, uh, and investors, and many of which are actually not from the UK. They're, they're willing to invest in the UK if they see a market opportunity here, a clear, unambiguous market opportunity. So I know that's something that, um, that um, you know, well, we as a whole sector have been pushing for. So, yeah. And I mean, you know, we're sitting here with COP at the background, mm -hmm. and, and that's a very public statement, and it's a, a public process of commitment. Um, 
and you know, Andrew, you've, you've, I think, perhaps taken the biggest step with public engagement in terms of the investment and some of the crowdfunding opportunities and blending that with more institutionalised investment. And, you know, it feels to me, I think, if you look at the coverage that the wider public business is understanding that, you know, the status quo is not an option, we have to invest in the future. Um, you know, in terms of underpinning that investment, what are the signals that are going to be really helpful for getting either public crowdfunding or, or larger scale institutional and, and corporate investment into, into the sector? Yeah, well, I mean, it, it really has to, the final piece of the jigsaw puzzle for us anyway is really that policy support. So, you know, we feel we've got the empirical evidence out the technology that should give people confidence that the kind of, the quantums in terms of price that we need for electricity at this stage is is justifiable and as Max was saying we're not talking about deploying at gigawatts of this no, yeah, yeah. you know um, we that we should be we we should be giving confident confidence and comfort that's what we're saying is that where we've landed this technology from a starting price at this curve it's almost before most cost reduction yeah. curves start um, we haven't even got to the tens of megawatts yet um, is compelling and the metrics around the amount of steel content in it you know, the supply chains that are established in familiar technologies, gearboxes, generators, and all these sorts of things should give us huge amounts of comfort that actually in a very small deployed volume of capacity, we can actually get this technology down to a very interesting mm -hmm. place. And that's what we're really trying to say is like, look, set a vision here, um, be bold, give some leadership here, set a vision. Um, it doesn't need to be huge, you know, for a UK context, gigawatt of power in the 2030s, we certainly think that delivering that type of scale will get the technology down below what government is happy to contract at carbon-free nuclear, i.e. 90 pounds megawatt hour in 2012 money. We think the technology can get down below that in that type of capacity. And the double win here is the multiplier from the supply chain. Yeah. So delivering like 100 megawatts of tidal stream technology pushed through UK supply chains, which we've established here, will generate the same manufacturing job benefits that delivering over a gigawatt of wind will. Yeah. So, you know, there's a win-win, but there's a, require to, a requirement yeah. to invest. Yeah. And the technologies are at the stage where it's becoming evident that they are there. They're ready to start that commercialization journey. So to my mind, it's no longer a question of if it will happen. Yeah. It's no longer a question of when it will happen. It really is, the last one is, where is it gonna happen? Yeah, and so, I mean, you know, just on that point, I mean, you know, the reason we're developing a project in Canada in Nova Scotia is because of the sp support of Nova Scotia for the sector. And I think the rest of the world could certainly take a leaf out of uh, Nova Scotia's book in terms of providing a, a signal at fairly low cost to the consumer mm -hmm. to, to get things going. That's the reason we've invested in the project. That's the reason we have investors, many investors in Germany actually, who've invested in the project is because of that leadership that, uh, that Nova Scotia and the Canadian government have, have put in place. So we would like to see, you know, obviously other countries follow that lead. And bizarrely, you know, um, the O2, we funded that commercially, largely commercially, and we were only able to do that because the prototype before accredited a terminal in EMEC yeah. for rocks. Yeah. Yeah. So we're actually being able to yeah, finance really. and deliver this innovative technology through a UK supply chain because of a historical support mechanism. Yeah. But we sit at the moment with less support for this sector than we did yeah. 10 years ago. Yeah, and I think that's a critical point. If you look at the market globally, uh, you know, you've got Canada, interesting enough, probably the number one global resource there. Europe certainly second place with the UK having about half of Europe's resource, and then you look where the tick, and then Indonesia, which is a wonderful archipelago and, and resource there. But the UK is certainly incredibly well positioned, and, is, and uh, interesting enough, has a lot of the companies uh, and, and supply chain and skills here already. Mm. So if we don't maximise it as a country, you know, we, we potentially lose a lot of GVA. I think, I think just just on that point, one of the because we've been at it for a long time, you know, other countries are still on their first curve. Mm -hmm. But we in the UK have actually been through a few ups and downs now. And what we were alluding to is that, you know, the O2 is funded off a policy commitment that was made back in the noughties and, you know, finished about mm -hmm. 2012. Um, and, and in the Orkney Islands, where, um, you know, a lot of the early supply chain was developed, you know, we hit, hit a high point of employment 
within a population of 22,000 people, we had uh, 350 people employed in the marine energy sector in 2012. And then the support policy support was withdrawn. We lost 100 jobs mm. just in that supply chain. So a third of the jobs were mm. lost. And now it's taken us time to diversify and build it up again. So you can actually see the cause and effect. It's not just if you do it, this might happen. Mm. We can actually show empirical evidence, which is back to your point. Mm. We can show you perfect evidence of what's going on. If you do this, this is the consequence of it. And look but at Denmark and how it's so many countries and, and, and industries have really benefited and just piggyback the riding you know wind sector right, yeah. yeah but I wanted to talk about people as well because you know I think we have a really strong um, marine energy cluster uh, here in the UK you can kind of go from from Edinburgh to Glasgow to Inverness to Orkney um, and, and 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 other locations and and you know people are in that sector they 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 can move between companies you know some companies won't make it some will you know but that's that's the history, that's how clusters develop, that's how successful clusters develop, whether it be Silicon Valley or, or anything like that. So, you know, although our, our main focus at the moment is Canada, we've got half our team of 37 here in the UK, we probably spent well on five million pounds last year in the UK supply chain. Um, so, you know, we'd like to spend more, we'd like yeah, to do I more, think, we'd like to employ yeah, more. Yeah. I mean, I think there's actually there's, there's an important thing to highlight there in terms of the opportunity is that because this is you starting and germinating a new industry, is the barriers for the manufacturers to engage and invest yeah. and get, get a market leading position are really low. Yeah. You know, we're talking about simple things, yeah. you know, installing a, an overhead crane in a shed allows you to do something 30% cheaper. Yeah. We're not asking for, you know, 400 million pound port upgrade, yeah. or, you know, yeah. and because we're not delivering on that sort of scale. But it means from a barrier of entry or investment from the supply chain, it's much much lower and it's achievable. Yeah. So it's it's a really close opportunity from a manufacturing yeah. socio-economics perspective. Is that yeah. not big barriers? And the difference between sorry, <laughs> well, I was just going to say and the difference with something like well, I wind. If you want to try and establish that supply chain here in the UK, it's really, really hard because, you know, it's already been done elsewhere. If you're in Denmark, you already mm -hmm. have your supplier that supplies you with a fastener or a widget or a thing. And, and you know, if, whenever you want, if you want to change your supplier, if you're, you know, an established technology, it's a big risk. You know, that, that supplier, that alternative supplier would probably have to be 20 or 30 percent cheaper to really justify the time and effort and kind of looking at it and checking that it works and, and yeah. using it. If you already have your trusted thing and it does what you want and they're on a curve anyway. Yeah. You know. and, and a time when supply chain length has become very apparent to all of us, mm. um, I think that, that uh, the capacity of a new technology like Tidal to create local supply chains, um, as, as Max was saying, you know, there's, a, there's basically a cluster of small businesses it, it's a predominantly, overwhelmingly small business driven sector. And that's where these innovation mm. companies have been able to play a role, not only in the engineering side, but on the environmental side and other parts of, of the, the skills that are needed. Um, and this goes back to, to your point, Andrew. I think it's a choice for us as a country about where we want to create value and jobs mm. in the future. And you know, Max is explaining, you know, you've had to go to Canada to find a market mm. that allows you to, to step on but you would be very happy to come back to the UK if there was a market to, mm. to, to exploit. And Certainly to invest in projects, yeah. yeah. I mean, we're already here, but, you know, yeah. we'd like to do more. Yeah. yeah. And I think a lot comes out to the sort of stickiness of the supply chain and, like, you know, a lot of this can be containerized and moved and it's a sector that's ultimately moving towards modularization and, and, and replication. And that's important because it's, it's a sector that can move quickly. So, so just to come to an end on this next segment, um, you know, I think what we've shown is that the tidal energy you know, is, is at a competitive cost compared to other uh, launch technologies from the start. We started off at a level that was better than the rest. And what we've do, we're doing is coming down a curve as we get volume, um, and we're taking major steps down that curve, uh, and we can see a glide path to be very competitive in the future. Mm -hmm. But the value isn't just created by the energy itself, it's created by the jobs, the supply chain opportunities that it creates, and the geographies where it, it, it meets. And we also touched, I think, there about some of the unique market opportunities. There are people and places who need tidal energy because it's their best option. 
And what I'd like to do in the final segment is take a look at some of those export markets and think about where tidal energy may play mm -hmm. a perfect role in developing opportunities in the future. Um, so at, at this point, though, um, unfortunately, because of time constraints, Keith's going to have to leave us. So, Keith, I'd like to thank, thank you. you very much for being with us. Um, thank you. And I'm thank sure you. Max and, and Andrew will uh, deal with, with your interests <laughs> to the best of their ability in the final session. But thanks very much. Many thanks. Yeah. And um, we'll join the rest of you in five minutes for the last segment. Thank you. Thanks.
So welcome back to this third segment looking at uh, tidal energy in the UK and the contribution that it can make to our energy systems and the wider economy. So in the first two segments we had a look at the uh, technology as a whole and, and what characterizes tidal stream as opposed to other forms of energy generation. Um, in the second segment we started having a look at the cost of generation and the cost curve reduction that the technology is going down and how value is created across the economy from tidal energy. So in this third segment, what we're going to do now is look at the export opportunities and the, the way in which this sector that's been developed in the UK can then have an influence in the world and how the world interacts with the opportunities that we have in the UK. So um, I'm joined with Andrew Scott from Orbital Marine and Max Karkas from Sustainable Marine. And, um, uh, unfortunately, Keith, who was with us in the first two segments, has had to leave. But um, so actually in the break, we started to get into the opportunities that there are and, you know, the choice that we have, if you like, as a country about where value comes from the sector in terms of jobs and employment and investment. Um, and there's an interesting dynamic there in terms of export opportunities, which obviously um, require us to be doing things abroad um, and the stickiness um, of, of what we do in, in the home market as well. Um, and because I've started with Andrew for every other question, I'll come over to Max just to, to break the pattern. <clears throat> but um, Max, in, in terms of that proposition, um, you know, with your experience, how do you see the, the, the balance being struck between homegrown industry versus export industry? And obviously as a company, you know, you've been in this position where there's been a very good tariff available to you in Canada. You, you've followed that opportunity. You know, how does that color where you see the future and the opportunities associated with that? Yeah, no, I think, um, I mean, you know, as I was sort of alluding to earlier that you need to, um, you know, if a particular country wants to, to get the opportunity here, you have to plant seeds, you know, and, and the future is uncertain. We, we know, whatever we know, we know the future is uncertain. Um, you know, who could have predicted um, today that the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy would become a reality? The, the sort of phone in your pocket yeah. tells you all about the, the, the universe and sometimes gets it wrong. But, um, you know, and so the, the future is uncertain. But what is certain is, is if you back a number of things, you're going, to, you're going to do better out of it. And in the UK, we've historically had a kind of poor um, level of investment in R&D. Um, but this is definitely an area that's that's very R and D rich, and if you plant that seed, you can get the the opportunity. And you know, an example is the Danish wind industry, for example, where um, early support for that sector in that country has led to the Danish wind industry. I think the figure was in 2016, it produced more in exports than the UK's um, arms industry, the UK's defence industry. So, um, significant opportunity um, to to sort of realise that. Now, you know how that might develop. Um, you know, it's, it's very difficult to tell. But we, we already, you know, as a UK company, are, you know, uh, exporting um, know-how and, and, and sort of technology. We've got, uh, we've had orders from Japan. We've had orders from, um, uh, from the US for some of our um, associated infrastructure for the anchoring technology. Um, so, yeah, no, it's, it's the world needs, needs solutions. And, and we're, we're happy to kind of look at where that those opportunities are so yeah so so just before i come to andrew again just to explore that a bit more because in the connected world that we live in it's not as simple as developing something somewhere and then taking it somewhere else mm. or not um, and i'm thinking about your own company history you know you've got shoppel who are a huge part of what you're doing you know from germany mm. and and the uk effectively created a magnetism for the tidal sector by the um, support and the, the rocks that it established in, in 2000, you know, the early 2000s. Um, so in a sense, the UK became the center for the global industry. It wasn't just a UK mm -hmm. homegrown industry. Um, so yeah, we need to think about how we manage those relationships very carefully. And actually rather than you, because this does take us straight back to Orbital, because yours was a homegrown technology you know it was mm -hmm. something that was born in Stromness from ideas and then it's been developed very much as a, as a UK technology um, you know how do you see that internationalization and, uh, of of opportunities going forward and that balance between 
incentive, investment, jobs, technology? Yeah, so <clears throat> I think, uh, you know, the, I guess the way I kind of see it is the ask, the policy ask that we're making at the moment, although optically it looks high, we've discussed how that's actually just required over short volumes because the cost reduction curve is very steep. But I see it very much as an investment into a UK supply chain. So, you know, I think it's, it's been, for us, it's been a really, uh, you know, fulfilling journey going out and engaging with a UK supply chain because there's huge amounts of capabilities, skills and facilities there um, that sit in our indigenous businesses here. And some of them are, you know, legacies or associated with things like, you know, composite manufacturing down on the south coast of yeah, England, yeah. sailing boats, that's where our blades for O2 came from. Um, a company in North Wales that do military stuff predominantly built our anchors. Um, you know, supply chain for kind of oil and gas predominantly in the, in the Midlands, did a lot of our hydraulics around Leeds and Sheffield and things. We had steel came from uh, uh, rolling mills in Motherwell and it was fabricated in Fife and assembled, painted and manufactured in Dundee. And it was the first vessel that got launched from Dundee in 40 years. And I just found that was a, a very fulfilling process to engage. But it also demonstrates the capabilities within the supply chain. So that optic ask of, of a high strike price to start an industry is an investment into entrenching a supply chain that is then competitive at a global level. So yeah, sure. A huge aspirations and desire to take this business and our vision into a global marketplace. Now, if we do that too early, yeah. you know, we do run the risk of hemorrhaging some of those long-term industrial opportunities. So it's a kind of balance. You know, we're out speaking to policymakers in, uh, in in countries around the world that have got tidal stream and that can help them transition and to net zero and complement whatever renewable policies they have at the moment, um, because we're not here to displace wind or solar, we're here to complement sort of thing. But really, from a, you know, from a UK perspective, we want to kind of keep very much a UK focus. Um, it, it allows us to use our, our resources in the company, we're a small company, you know, it allows us to use our resources in a more focused way, but critically, it does allow us to really make, uh, with our supply chain, make investment into UK capabilities that can then retain that you know the big the big opportunity in many ways is how do we make sure that every megawatt of tidal stream energy that's deployed globally has 30 40 percent uk content in it because that's a massive opportunity for wealth creation and job creation on yeah. a sustainable basis yeah. and and i mean the, the the challenge for all of us i think in this global world if if we had somebody here from indonesia or mm, canada or, say, yeah. or chile you know they would be saying but you know we want our slice of the cake as well and and i think it it kind of behoves us if you like as a sector not to get too precious about the individual percentages if you can have a small piece of cake out of a big cake you know that's better than having no slice of a very small cake so um yeah i think you know max how how are there any particular areas that you think are are rich for strategies that might help you know the uk exploit those opportunities associated well i think with so, yeah i mean sometimes we we become you know quite focused on our own navel and what our own country's target is but you know to solve climate change it's a global problem and it needs solutions that that are delivered globally um, and arguably somewhere like Denmark um, with its wind turbine technology has had a far greater impact yeah. on uh, mitigating climate change than any Denmark um, inward focused yeah. um, policies and you look at countries you know that have been the focus of this this COP26 um, Indonesia for example deforestation um, uh, and coal, you know, trying to remove coal out of the equation. And so, you know, we can be part of that mix. You know, some of these countries, um, Philippines, Indonesia, you know, huge archipelagos of islands and island in coastal communities. And not every one of those will be suitable for tidal energy, but there's certainly, you know, a number of very interesting locations there which, um, you know, we could... Uh, we could all play a part in, but you kind of want to make sure you ground that in doing doing things sort of on your doorstep first before going, um, you know, too 
too much out there. But um, you know, one of the nice things with our technology is that it, you know, it can be sort of um, you know, done in that manner, as we've yeah. shown already. The platform we have in Canada was originally uh, here in Scotland. Uh, we tested it here first before we took it across to Canada, and there's no reason we couldn't do that in, in, yeah. in other locations. We, we did touch on early on in our discussions about the diversity of markets, and <clears throat> you've just alluded there, Max, to the myriad of tidal streams there are in the world. And in our own company's work, you know, we've created this tidal database, uh, which amounts now to 12,000 tidal streams. Uh, across the world, which is, is a fair number. Um, but what's really interesting then is if you look at the market applicability in each of those streams, the numbers start to change. So not all of those streams are close to urban areas. Um, you know, some of them are very remote. Some of them might be in ice affected areas. Others have other issues associated with them. Uh, so we need to think very carefully about the applicability of particular technological technological solutions yeah. for particular areas. But I think you know linked to that is and you know you don't want to kind of have um, mixtures of, of sort of prototype technologies but but equally there are you know potentially you know if you've got an energy resource somewhere you know if the world is moving towards different forms of, of, of energy of, of zero carbon energy you know there's a lot of debate around hydrogen and what role it could play um, you know you could see you know that you could have you know re remote um, um, ways of building up these capacities, and that may well be the case, you know, with wind and solar as well. So it's, yeah. it's an interesting. That's what I mean. You know, it's very difficult to predict the future um, and, and what might actually come through that. But you know, if you've got uh, if you've got your, you know foot in the door. Um, but but the the, it's, it's the lesson there that if you are interested in building up capacity in a technology like this. Mm. You can't just think of the electrons, you have to think about your wider mm. industrial strategy, which isn't just your home industrial strategy. You need to think about the relationship you're going to have with the places you're going to go to. And you know, Andrew, you just highlighted a very, you know, fantastic list of homegrown suppliers that were mm. able to deal with the technology in, in the UK for, for your Orkney deployments. Um, when you go to another country, you know, say in Southeast Asia or South America, are there particular parts of the technology that you feel could be um, you know, developed and, and um, supplied locally that, that are going to help provide local content for whichever is the host country and community? <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, you could take it to the extremities and say it all is because, you know, I, all the components and systems are based on available manufacturing lines. And, you know, we're not doing rocket science. There's no unobtainium in here. So, you know, anybody can do it. Um, I think, you know, the point is, is that uh, every kind of, uh, you know, country has its own profile of capabilities and things. And, you know, I think the UK, you know, wants to invest and should be investing in a in a portfolio of industries, the same way yeah. they should have a portfolio of energy generation. So there's parts of the turbine for sure that um, we feel are good fit for capabilities and know-how and engineering that we've got available here. You know, clearly, you know, things like logistics work against some areas of it. Now, although tidals, because it's a super dense resource, things are smaller and will not scale the technology like wind has, yeah. where We're the sky is the limit, You're the seabed's the limit for us. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, turbines might not get much bigger than, you know, we're at two megawatts at the moment. There are some big sites that maybe could take three, four megawatt turbines or something, but you're maybe never going to get to composite blade lengths that are longer than, let's say, 15, 16 meters, yeah, yeah. which is clearly a different logistical pro problem to, you know, wind turbine blades that are 120 yeah. meters or something like that. So it allows us to potentially export and logistically deal with a lot of the high value components with a UK supply chain. But, yeah, you know, big, big, um, you know, big uh, steel structures, which are effectively, you know, like building boats. Um, absolutely fairly straightforward manufacturing processes that you can find in any shipyard around yeah, the world. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's, it's horses for courses. As I said, you know, we, the, the ambition, it's an, it would be an unrealistic ambition to try and think 100% of every megawatt that went in around the world could be manufactured here in the UK. Yeah. Um, could it be 30, 40%? Yeah, I definitely think it is. It could be, but that does require investment into the UK. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And, and when we look at these other um, markets around the world. Um, you know, we talked earlier on about the difference in energy prices in the UK. So, you know, we have a number of energy markets. There's not just one energy market. And um, another little kind of trick, if you like, that we use is is to think of the world in grid squares. And 
there's basically 500 million square kilometers on the surface of the earth. And for us, each of those square kilometers is a potential market. Now, if you're in the middle of the Pacific, well, I was going to say there isn't a market, but actually there might be in terms of picking up the plastic that's mm -hmm. floating there or, or, or somehow extracting minerals from the ocean, which the Americans are looking at uh, very highly. But when you come into the coastal and um, uh, nearshore areas, you know, each of those bits of sea and land mm. have their own characteristics. It's sort of yeah. your version of um, what three words, is it? Yes, exactly. We power needed here. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes, exactly. A lot of energy or not much energy. Um, but um, when, when you look at each of those squares, there are, there are places, you know, say in the higher latitudes where the, the conditions are extremely harsh and they push you down a certain direction and, and ice is, is one issue that we have to deal with in the tidal sector. When you move into the tropics, um, it might be that the you know, adjacent land is covered in virgin forest and even though there's mm. a community living there, you wouldn't want to be cutting trees down to, to put solar in or, or um, you know, there may not be available space. So you've got an ideal opportunity there. Um, so you know, it, it feels that tidal can be the right primary solution in a number of areas. And then we talked earlier on about how tidal can be enabled by other things happening. So, uh, and uh, actually I've just taken back home to, to Orkney again, where there's been the announcement of the Scotwind offshore le leasing round. That's thought to generate 10 gigawatts of offshore wind potential. There's talk of literally perhaps 100 gigawatts of potential around those areas. Now, the infrastructure that comes with that, it seems to me could be transformational in terms mm -hmm. of what tidal energy could do in an area like that. But also the corollary is that tidal energy can add a balancing mechanism mm -hmm. to wind, for example, and fill some of the times when you know, the wind isn't blowing. So you know, there's another bonus there. So it, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily simple and to take your phrase, it's not rocket science, but there are a number of strands that we need to look at here to look at the total value that can be gained well, I mean, from tidal energy. You know, I mean, we've seen, with the with the uptake of wind and solar on the system that you know obviously if you if it is in the winter and the solar's low and you've got lulls of you know two or three days it's the the word is dunkelflort apparently in oh, really? german <laughs> yeah to cover these sort of periods of, of dark uh, dark and not much wind um but you know tidal's just there doing its thing every day it's totally predictable um for a you know thousand years well forever um, as, as, to, as to what it'll do. So it very much is a different value um, that you're getting from that. And as we talked about in the very first session, you know, couple that with storage. And um, you, one of the things if, you've built, if you build a storage project is you want that storage to be used a lot. So something that does it every day, you know, twice a day, you know, is, is yeah. exactly what you want. And, and when we look around, you know, in the UK, um, there's clearly different streams of different capacity um, different markets, it might be transport markets, it might be grid connected electricity markets, we might be fueling ships from tidal energy you know, through conversion to hydrogen or ammonia. Um, are there any of those kind of, um, I, was, I call them alternative, but maybe a better word is progressive markets, because they're not really alternatives, they're things that we need. Um, are you thinking about how your technologies might blend in with that at the moment? Yeah, well, I mean, the O2 is connected to an electrolyzer oh, and, a, said, yeah. and a battery unit as well. So trying to play both those emerging kind of areas. Um, I think, you know, <coughs> we, yeah, we absolutely look at it. And, you know, your gut feel is that, you know, something that is a dependable, predictable source of green energy has a value to play. It's very difficult, though, at this stage, both because you know, some of those energy mediums of hydrogen and ammonia, because that whole market hasn't really crystallized yet. You know, there isn't really a, an off taker yet, yeah. particularly on it. Mm. it. It's difficult to quantify that upside. It's similar to kind of, um, you know, under the CFD, actually, you wouldn't get really an upside by being generating mm. when Bayes would, or the, uh, yeah. the LCC would, would get an upside, which is don't get necessarily from wind. So. Um, it's quite difficult at this stage yet to be able to fully quantify some of the economic benefits or upsides that you get to this. But I think they're all in the pipeline. And, you know, for me, what I think is very reassuring is, is just how dynamic the whole energy landscape is. Yeah. You know, some of these really progressive projects that are getting tabled right now, specifically in Europe, 
and looking at things like hydrogen and looking at how do you decarbonize shipping and stuff like that is that, um, yeah, these are all great, interesting areas that I think only add to uh, the needs case for not just more green power, but predictable green power. It doesn't, what I would say is it doesn't take the foot off the pressure and us understanding that ultimately what we do need to do behind all this is drive the cost of energy down for yeah. the system. And, and, so. and these questions that you're raising there are, are not tidal energy questions. They're questions about our energy system as a whole. You know, we, we need as a country and every country needs to develop not, you know, I think across the world people have looked at electricity and they're saying how can we decarbonize electricity? And, yeah. and that's something that we kind of know the answer to that. What we haven't yet got is the answer to how do we decarbonize our whole energy system? And that's where things like Tidal can play an even greater role because of some of the balancing services and things that they have. But it, it, just to say, it's not that we're, we're, we're taking complacency out of that. No. that. Then that somehow justifies us. Yeah, we yeah. still believe fundamentally on the merits of cost, we can get this technology mm -hmm. down to yeah, a place yeah, yeah. That, that argues its need on the system. Yeah. just on a pure cost yeah. basis. Yeah. Yeah. And all these other things are upside drivers. Yeah, yeah I mean, I think just to, to build on your point, uh, Gareth, to, to, to reach net zero in the UK, um, assuming we get some uh, efficiencies in terms of uh, insulation, insulate Britain, um, uh, you know, to reduce heat loss, assuming we get efficiencies from employing electric vehicles, which are far more efficient than, than, than petrol or diesel vehicles, um, despite all that, we probably, because the solution to both heating and, uh, and, and vehicles is, is largely electric, and even if it's hydrogen, it's ele it electrolysis for that, then um, we're going to need an awful lot more um, clean power, clean electricity to, to support those markets. And by my estimation, and, and maybe some others as well, um, I reckon it's probably about um, four to five times what we've already done to date and we've done a lot to date. You know, there's a lot of onshore wind, a lot of solar, a lot of offshore wind. And even with the government's sort of targets for, for offshore wind, we're not where, you know, we've got an awful lot more we need to do. So we, we really do need um, everything in the box. Yeah. And I think, you know, for me as well, just like casting, you know, the view outside, you know, the export, that is a really exciting space. You know, if we can park the point that, you know, we want to focus from a policy perspective and a manufacturing perspective to try and nurture and grow things here in the UK water. There's huge opportunity. I think like, you know, what you were saying, Gareth, about, you know, every space has its own values. It's got its own ecosystems and it's got its own yeah. resources. Yeah, yeah. Is that sometimes we get so kind of tunnel vision about this, the, the amphitheater that we, we participate and play in the, in, the, in the North and Europe area, where really globally, we've probably yeah. got the the, uh, the, you know, the, all the ingredients to get the very lowest cost form of renewable yeah, energy. Yeah, yeah. You know, we've got really mature supply chains, great infrastructure, and just phenomenal resource in wind and things like that. That's not the same everywhere around the world. So you look at places like we've mentioned it a couple of times, you know, things like Indonesia, and so 80% of their power is still coming from coal. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. You know, and wind might not be the same resource there. The levelized mm. cost of energy for wind might not be anywhere near what it is here. And so they're much more <coughs> potentially nearer term market opportunities for us that could actually have from a bang for buck decarbonization perspective, a huge, huge benefit. Yeah. So, you know, I, you know, I think those kind of markets and other tidal stream markets are, are massively interesting on that. On that front. Yeah, I mean, we, we've talked about cost and we've, we've, we've talked about um, the environmental aspects, you know, the, the imperative mm. to decarbonize um, these things. The other element we shouldn't forget as well, which is sort of implicit, I suppose, a little bit of what we're saying, is security of supply. Mm -hmm. You know, and we've seen the issues with the constrained gas supply at the moment. Um, I mean, gas is obviously something you don't want to use, burn, because it produces CO2. But, you know, it's, it's touted as cleaner than coal. But nonetheless, you know, it's squeezed. Everyone wants this gas at the moment. And, and so if you can use a resource that's on your doorstep, it's uh, a and, and coal. Well, <laughs> and a, a clean resource on your doorstep. Yeah, exactly. That's <laughs> but I think also, and, and just to bring us back to total energy systems rather than electrical energy systems, you, you mentioned there about the energy density, oh, sorry, the carbon density of electricity. Mm. But actually, if we think about the carbon density of energy in the UK, suddenly we go from 265 or wherever we are, 200 grams per kilogram, way back up to, you know, we're, we're in the analogous situation because 
all of our transport fuel mm. is carbon full. Mm. Uh, and so, and, and I think what's interesting about transport is you don't have the immediacy of demand issues that you have with electrical supply because, you know, we all expect the switches to come on and, you know, as we know, we've got twice the electrical infrastructure that we need just to make sure it's always there. But with transport, it's a bit more of an intermittent um, supply because we carry storage with us in whatever mode of transport we're using. Um, and that will bring with it different demands. Um, and it may be that there's a sweet spot there for some of the things we've talked about, some of the resource hotspots that we're looking at, where perhaps for shipping, but also for vehicle transport, um, you know, tidal energy might provide a really good match for the demands of that. But I don't think actually, as a country or as a world, we've probably not actually got there and looked specifically at you know, how marine energy, how tidal energy can match our non-electrical markets, and, and that's something that we've got to do in the future. So, you know, the, the, the interesting thing is there that despite being at it for 20 years, we've probably still not answered all the questions that we need, you know, for our ultimate success. Yeah. I think, you know, one of the other things, I think what you're really highlighting as well is that, you know, the transition to net zero is going to be driven by innovation, mm. you know, and, you know, for me, I'm an optimist, but I also kind of think that, you know, this is, we need to, in a way, inject a bit of excitement mm. in this in this challenge. And actually, you know, being a front-running country and economy in terms of uh, driving vision uh, it, to, to, to reach these net zero, it creates this really brilliant environment for innovation. Mm. I'd like to think, you know, maybe we're kind of a case example, for, but it's only one, yeah, you know, yeah. is that the changes that are going to be required around d demand, uh, generation, technology use, and all these things, it's a really, really, I think it's a really exciting place to be. And so I think, you know, for the, that, you know if that's, that should be a, a kind of underlying um, uh, sort of momentum behind policy here is that support these areas, support these visions, support these targets, that puts an emphasis on innovation. Because yeah. innovation will generate new opportunities yeah. that have global application, whether it's just in tidal stream energy, whether it's in kind of demand response, all these types of things. I think it's a, it's a really interesting time to, to live in um, if we get things right. So, right? so, so wh where I'm led to in, after that comment is the fact that maybe like air travel and space travel have been seen as the the, the areas where most innovation happens in our society. You know, if you go to space, if you've designed something for space, that's the real top end engineering. But I go back to my point that we actually got into space long before we'd actually extracted energy from the tides. And you know, those of you at the sharp end know, and yeah, I know as well, it's one of the toughest challenges because of that density of water and the, the forces that are upon you. So if we're looking for a group of people that are gonna help not just deliver tidal energy, but be able to innovate out of some of the challenges that we've got. This is a fantastic sector to invest in and back because you know, we've got hundreds of some of the best innovators there ready to work on all these energy challenges. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. So um, it sounds as though we're building to a crescendo of opportunity here. Um, so thinking then, you know, we've got a fantastic team, Team UK in terms of the tidal sector. We've got technologies within that. Uh, we've kind of talked about the export opportunities uh, and, and how that can develop. Just to touch on that one, once again and just think about, are there particular geographies or particular strategies that you see that might be attractive for developing those export markets? Um, you know, are there parts of the world or parts of that market segmentation you know, that, that you're particularly focusing on in the future? Well, I think you know yourself, Gareth, that, you know, to, to look at a particular um, location is, is an investment itself. You have to look at, at uh, you know, what is the dynamics of what do the community want in a particular location? What's the resources of available? What's the, you know, tidal resource? What are other resources? Um, what are the logistics involved? Um, what is the local supply chain like? So there's, there's, a, there's a bunch of investment that has to go into that in looking at different sites and, uh, and you know that you know I suppose is 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 a kind of theme in in terms of you know taking this forward is is um, is, is having the right signals to to propel that along. Um, anyway, you're particularly looking at Andrew for steps outside the UK and particularly market opportunities in those areas. 
Well, yeah, I mean, I think it, it, it's a, a little bit like Max, at a strategic level, you know, obviously projects take investment, you know, going and servicing projects, new regions take investment and things. So ideally you want to see scale of market opportunity to be making them, to driving them. Um, you know, you ideally, again, with the space that we're working in, you know, it's po policy familiarity with the challenges that we talk about, not just with marine renewables, but renewables in general, about how you cater for them onto the network and cre create that investment um, uh, proposition. So, you know, Max has mentioned it a few times, you know, Canada, uh, the Canadians are, are, are quite forward thinking in terms of their, not just their vision on, you know, renewables, but particularly they've got some big tidal sites. So Canada's interesting for us, East Coast of Canada as well, it's not actually that much, that far away. But, um, you know, ultimately we want to very quickly de-risk the technology that it, it doesn't become too terrifying to think about going and doing projects in, you know, all the corners of the world where yeah. tidal stream works. So certainly big market opportunity in places like Indonesia, Philippines, yeah. you know, Japan, um, uh, Alaska as well, places like that. So yeah. these are all things, and that nearer term actually, even places like France. Yeah. Excellent. So I think we're kind of getting to the end of this segment. Um, and um, maybe, um, you know, I think we've had a look through the three sessions at you know, where the technologies come from, the kind of principles behind it and how it can be applied in different places. Uh, we've looked at the cost base that we've got at the moment and how, as we've said a number of times, tidal energy started off in a good place and it's getting even better in terms of cost. But when we look at the diversity of energy markets that are around the world, um, there's many opportunities for tidal energy to actually be deployed at the moment cost effectively. Um, and that way in which governments um, and uh, markets use the power that they have to attract technology um, and therefore the benefits that come with it. If you create the right tariff environment, if you create the right market, you can pull jobs and employment f to that marketplace. The corollary is also true. If you don't create those markets, then you start losing the jobs and the opportunities associated with that. And I think you know, the tidal energy sector has shown over the, the decades that we've been involved in it, how those patterns wax and wane depending on the policy commitments that, that are, are achieved there. Um, I think we've also seen that there's a great opportunity for energy to be provided to the UK energy system. You know, we've got an incredible need for energy new decarbonized energy, not just for solving electrical decarbonization, but for the even bigger challenge of transport and heat decarbonization. And, you know, it may be that tidal energy plays an even greater role in that than it could do in terms of electrical decarbonization. And through the excellent innovation uh, and the skills and the expertise and the understanding we've created in the UK, we can then take that and go to other parts of the world. And it's not going to be delivering tidal energy with a bow on it to these other places, because every place that we go to is going to want its own piece of the action. Everywhere where tidal energy from the UK has an influence is going to want to be part of the manufacturing process and part of the intellectual process of creating these projects going forward. But I think the foundations that we've laid in here in the UK will allow that to happen because it's in the ethos of the companies that are in this sector as SME communities to engage with the communities that they're working in uh, for the best uh, of everybody that's involved. So I'd like to thank Andrew Scott from uh, Orbital Marine and Max Carcass from Sustainable Marine for joining me this afternoon. I hope you've enjoyed those three segments. And on behalf of me, Gareth Davis from Aquaterra, I'd like to thank you for engaging with us and look forward to seeing you again sometime soon. Thanks very much, Gareth. Thank you, Gareth.